Welcome back to Most Amazing Facts. Today, Ask Reddit asks historians, marine biologists, biologists, and cryptozoologists of Reddit, as far as legends and history go, what legendary creature do you believe may have been real and probably existed in some way, or what supposedly legendary person in history was more than likely real? Archaeologist here. There's a really interesting ancient Egyptian story called The Shipwrecked Sailor in which a man is washed ashore, a beautiful island, and is apprehended briefly by an enormous serpent. In the story, the serpent tells him that there used to be hundreds of others like him, but a falling star wiped them all out. I think it's unlikely that the Egyptians had knowledge of dinosaurs, but there's a site called Wadi Hitan that has thousands of ancient whale skeletons from the Eocene. I think it's possible they could have seen these skeletons and mistaken them for giant snakes. Herodotus actually tells similar tales of giant flying snakes in Egypt, and I suppose if you saw these skeletons but no trails, you might think they were capable of flight. Depending on how they were excavated, I'd have to imagine the pectoral fins of a fossilized whale could have even resembled wings, though I'm not sure if any images of their flying snakes were winged. Changelings, babies switched off by fairies, were probably an early explanation for birth defects. Also may explain postpartum depression. Think about it in ye olden days. After all, isn't a mother meant to naturally love and bond with her baby? Like, automatically. So why am I not bonding with mine? Why do I feel like a failure of a mother? Oh, maybe the fairies came and took my actual baby away, and I am protecting myself from the fairy magic. More likely autism. Children with autism seem to develop normally for 12 to 18 months, then suddenly change and become much more withdrawn and uncommunicative. You could easily believe that your kid had been stolen by the fairies and an imposter left in their place. Note that 12 to 18 months is also when kids get their immunizations, hence the vaccines made my kid autistic bullcrap. Any sort of infant death, really. The parents will obviously feel a little bit better if they can believe the baby that died was a changeling and their own baby was stolen by fairies, but is alive and happy with them. The Lusca, giant octopus. It supposedly lives in the blue holes of the coast of Florida, and the amount of food and temperature of water both support the theory of an octopus living long enough to grow way larger than we expect based on our current records. The Destination Truth episode about it was pretty cool. Blue holes? Just curious what you're referring to. I live in Florida and need to stray away from such holes. Thanks. I've heard of a hypothesis that states the Ragnarok myth actually describes an impact event. The Midgard snake could be an object entering the atmosphere. There was a Bronze Age meteorite impact in Estonia that became a key element of Finnish mythology. Perhaps the myth percolated over to the Nordics. I regularly get to see pods of humpback whales at the beach where I surf. Most of the time, all you see is their backs as they partially surface from the water. Occasionally, one of them breaches mouth first, so you see a giant mouth emerge from the water. Other times, you see a giant tail emerge. If you were watching them and had no idea what a whale was, or that you were looking at a multiple of them, I could easily imagine mistaking multiple whale backs as the coils of a colossal snake. I strongly suspect that this is the origin of legends of sea serpents. While that could be one origin, take a look at the oarfish. I think that might be the more likely origin as it can grow to absolutely massive sizes. 11 meters, the page says, as the largest published length, with unconfirmed sightings of up to 17 meters. Beowulf, who is featured in one of the most important texts written in Old English, may have very well been real. The epic details what people Beowulf belonged to, the Geats who resided in modern Godaland, and if I recall correctly, battles which have taken place according to historians, particularly between the Geats and the Swedes. Most intriguing to me are the facts that the location of Beowulf's burial mound is included in the epic, and that there is what looks like a hill at the, that location in modern Sweden that has never been excavated. Very simple mythological creatures like black dogs were probably exaggerated stories of encountering wild dogs in the dead of night. They're often described as having glowing eyes, which isn't an unusual effect when torchlight is reflected in dogs' or cats' eyes. The black dog spirit slash myths of the British Isles are also likely the grim Professor Trelawney was talking about in The Prisoner of Azkaban. I live in Suffolk, England, where the most high-profile cases of the black dog, or black shuck, have happened. I was over at a friend's house who lived a village over from me. Her dad took me home, and my friend came along for the ride. Partway home, middle of nowhere, late in the evening, her dad almost swerved to miss something. We carried on, but he was visibly shaken. My friend also reacted to seeing something, and they both described the exact same thing. A big, black, shaggy dog in the middle of the road staring at them. 
It was the size of a large wolf, but looked skinnier, and its fur was far more coarse and matted. I was looking through the windscreen at the same time as this all happened, and I saw nothing. The black dog is supposed to give forewarning of a death in the family. I can't remember if that happened, but I do recall my friend losing her grandmother and uncle around the same time in our lives. I wish I could recall if it was after seeing the dog, but either way, it's a spooky tale. Arthur from the legendary people side of things, King Arthur was certainly someone who actually existed, albeit in a much different form than modern audiences would be familiar with. The earliest mentions of him are as a historical British king who lived during the 5th century. He's in a king's list. He's mentioned as winning a series of decisive battles against the Saxons, and his excellent swordsmanship is referenced once. And that's about it. During the Middle Ages, Arthur's tale was romanticized and then conflated with other myths and folklore. Several of his knights, such as Lancelot, were originally heroes of their own legends before being added to his, until we finally ended up with our present version that has all the medieval knights and magic in the round table and the holy grail business. It's entirely possible that the name of Arthur itself was part of this later conflation, as his victories against the Saxons were also credited in some sources to a general named Ambrosius Aurelianus. Those sources may be wrong, or they may have been two different leaders who were mistakenly combined by later writers, a king and his general, perhaps. Among historians who support Arthur's historicity, the thinking goes that he was a Romano-British, that is, Welsh leader, who fought against Saxon incursions and held them off during his lifetime, becoming ruler of part of Britain in the wake of Rome's withdrawal. His name would have originally been Roman, Artorius, which became Arthurus in the vulgar Latin, and was later shifted to Arthur by Celtic influence in the 6th century. Troy. The Trojan War is another legendary event that was certainly based on something real. We know Troy was a real city that was actually raised around 1190 BC, and we have a lot of evidence that says the Mycenae Greeks and the Hittite Empire fought several conflicts over the city, which was a powerful city-state and vassal of the Hittites at the time. The Trojan War from the Iliad is either a legendary account of the most glorious Mycenaean victory in these wars, or perhaps a dramatization of the entire series of wars distilled into one mythical conflict. As for the people mentioned in the stories, though, no telling. Many were likely based on actual nobles from the conflicts, but Greek mythos has a habit of adding in later heroes to famous stories. Combined with the massive time gap before we inherit our earliest surviving copy of the story, at least some of the characters were probably added later. Serious scholarship tries to identify which parts of the Iliad are most guilty of this, and which parts most resemble its Bronze Age origins. My favorite thinking from the historicity debate on Troy is that the whole Helen situation was originally understood to be a metaphor for the actual transgression that the Trojans committed. Hittite letters suggest that they were the aggressors but don't specify how. So we're left guessing about what sort of treaty violations or trade disputes that Helen might have been meant to represent. Damn, the Arthurian cinematic universe seems a bit cluttered. A rock could have been real. It was most likely inspired by the elephant bird of Madagascar. An elephant bird was like a big ass ostrich about nine feet high. They didn't go extinct until the 16th or 17th century. For sure. Also, even a condor could appear and probably be misidentified as being twice the size it is if something that wasn't familiar with it saw one in the wild. I forgot where I read this, but when people are afraid of something out in the wild, their accounts of it can make it out to be much, much larger than the real thing due to stress or fear. Oh man, you want the real gold standard stuff on this. You want aboriginal tales from dream time, which in many cases have been proven to be validated records predating the end of the last ice age. They coexisted with megafauna in Australia, and their crypto creatures have literally been linked back to now extinct fauna. The oral tradition of Australia is so incredible to me. Just the idea that history could be passed down so accurately for so long is just freaking amazing. Supposedly there was once a continent where New Zealand and Australia are that sunk. Imagine all the life that once existed there. There are many diseases that the origin of the vampire myth can be traced back to, however I think rabies fits it the most. In the olden days, people would tie those suspected of it to trees. In about three days time, the disease would drastically change them. Extreme light sensitivity, paleness, aggression, excessive drooling. They could or would try to attack you and have bouts of either extreme slow fatigue or even adrenaline. Also, rabies can be passed from person to person through a bite, not just an affected animal. Rabies honestly sounds like how a modern zombie virus would work. But unlike science fiction, rabies is real and terrifying. 
not to mention that vampires in the oldest myths were unable to cross running water, whereas rabies apparently gives one a fear of water, to the point that it's known as hydrophobia. As I've learned in the responses to my comment, hydrophobia, as it applies to those affected with rabies, describes more the painful inability to swallow water, and the fear of water that this might cause in those with cerebral dysfunction, than it does an actual implicit fear of water per se, Whichever of its multifarious forms the water might currently embody, rivers, rainfall, ponds, etc., and so any link you might draw between rabies and vampirism should be, remain purely speculative. Related, some of the earlier vampire myths talk about them having an extremely strong lust for women, and vampires would break in and sleep with them, with or without the blood sucking. It was generally a woman they fancied in life, like a husband looking for his wife, or a secret admirer looking for his crush, although some stories suggested they were strangers. It's believed that these were basically cover stories for some affairs. An adulterous couple would do their thing. Then, when signs of the entry and fun times were discovered, the woman could cover it up with, um, Vordalac, and the townspeople would all be like, holy crap, we gotta protect this poor vampire victim, instead of thinking she was cheating. Didn't help that any of the sightings of the vampire would be a man in a dark cloak in the dead of night. So they'd lock the doors and all that. Woman let the guy in. They'd go again, and in the morning she'd need to have an explanation. Um, he hypnotized me to open the door. And then they'd be like, holy crap, Vortilax can hypnotize people. It took off from there. Vortilax is an incorrect spelling of an actual early Romanian word for vampire, which was popularized in Family of the Vortilax. But I sadly can't remember the actual word. Apologies. The Cyclops of Greek mythology. Go Google up an elephant skull. There's this huge hole right in the middle of it looking to all the world like a single eye. Now add to this knowledge that the Cretan dwarf mammoth left sub-fossil bones on Crete easily discoverable, was one meter at the shoulder, and could be more or less assembled into a giant humanoid. You don't even need to rearrange the bones, just make the skeleton stand on its hind legs, remove the tusks, and boom, a cyclops skeleton. If I recall correctly, the Greek heroes wear bare skeletons that had been dug up and given proper burials and armor and later dug up again. Chupacabra. It has to be some poor sick animal with mange. Mange is highly contagious, so if a pack of coyotes or wild dogs got it, they would all have a weird appearance and attack other animals out of hunger. Specifically sarcoptic mange. Demodetic mange can cause a similar appearance, but isn't contagious if I recall correctly. But on that note, a lot of the video evidence I've seen circulated looks like coyotes with mange. A couple times raccoons. People don't realize just how weird certain animals look without their fur, but add crusty scabs all over and it can look like a monster. It's similar with jackalopes and wolpel tingers. There's actually a cancer that causes rabbits to have large horn-like protrusions from its heads. The Maori people of New Zealand have long told stories of the pauaki, a monstrous bird that was big enough to hunt and eat humans. Many believe that these stories are referring to the Haas seagull. It was the largest species of eagle to ever have lived on Earth, with weights of around 30 pounds and wingspans almost reaching 10 feet. It lived on New Zealand's South Island and primarily hunted the flightless moa bird, which weighed around 500 pounds. Given the large size of its main prey, it's likely the eagle may have also targeted lone humans as well. Interestingly enough, the Haas eagle went to stink around the year 1400, not long after the Maori arrived in New Zealand. It's thought that its extinction could be attributed to habitat destruction combined with the extinction of the moa due to hunting by the Maori. There is a child's skull in a museum somewhere with markings on the back and front near the eye sockets. Originally, archaeologists believed it to be linked to violence or sacrifice until they discovered it matched the talons of the Haas eagle exactly, and that it had been discovered in a pile of bones similar to the piles left by modern birds of prey. Kid was about six, and got bird snagged. 1. I believe that stories of wild men, giants, hairy bipeds, are rooted in hunter-gatherer cultures which existed on the periphery of civilization, as defined by early subsistence farmers. 2. King Arthur existed as at least one post-Roman warlord. 1. I would totally agree with this, and those sightings would get passed down as legends that would keep growing over time for sure. 2. Without a doubt, King Arthur's legend is simply too big to just be a tall tale, and he's probably even a collective legend of a few real-world leaders of lesser-known clans or knights. The Wendigo probably existed, just not as a creature. 
People in the far north who survived a brutal winter by eating a family member had a psychological escape hatch for the guilt and horror by convincing themselves they were transforming into a ravenous, murderous beast. They'd continue killing and eating in hysteric delusion that they had no control over it. Wendigo hunters would then have to come and kill them and perform a shamanic ritual to assure the rest of the tribe that the taint wouldn't spread. It's actually an incredibly fascinating study into culturally specific mental illness. The lengths the mind will go in order to avoid dealing with a traumatic event are so extraordinary that in that culture, they would actually continue to murder and cannibalize fellow tribe members under the delusion they had transformed into a monster. That's a very fascinating but very depressing segment of cross-cultural legal studies that looks as Wendigo lore also as representatives for other horrors, namely family violence and child sexual abuse. I don't have the book on hand, but I remember the introduction was a tale about a girl who was continuously bitten by a male family member. A female ancestor guides her to a riverbank that can treat her wounds with good medicine, but she either forgets or is hurt too many times that she gives up and ends up continuously biting her own daughter. Basically, it tells the story of how abuse and pain can be passed down through families and how people you love can be both victims and monsters. I think the book was called Watiko Legal Principles. There's a small population of albino deer in my area, and they are beautiful. Definitely ethereal looking and totally match the European description of a unicorn. The mythical unicorn likely derives from travelers from Africa or Asia to Europe trying to describe a rhinoceros. There are Asian rhinos in India, Nepal, and Indonesia. When you consider that ancient Greek depictions of lions sometimes looked more like dogs, and that the word hippopotamus comes from Greek words meaning river horse, it's easy to see how a Greek traveler would describe a rhino as a one-horned horse. There's linguistic evidence for this idea. 400 years ago, it was believed that there were two types of rhinos. Ones with two horns were called rhinoceros, and ones with single horn were called unicorn. So the word unicorn was used to describe both real rhinos and the mythical one-horned horse. It wasn't until zoology advanced as a science that unicorn came to refer purely to the mythical creature. There are still remnants of the original usage, though. The genus of the scientific names for Asian rhinos, which have one horn, is unicornus. 1. Based on multiple descriptions of the Australian cryptid, the bunyip, I firmly believe them to be seals who swim inland. 2. The kraken were likely colossal squid which swam up to the surface. 3. The black demon shark of Mexico is just a large great white with pigment issues. I believe a different theory on the bunyip, that it's a story passed on about megafauna. I've got a few cryptozoology books that describe the bunyip, and that's one of the more interesting cryptids for sure. The one thing that would separate them from the common seals is that they are supposed to be quite massive, so I'm not sure if a misidentification of a seal would cut it for every sighting. I've never heard of the black demon shark before, so now you've given me another cryptid to look up, so thank you. A colossal squid isn't likely to surface. Look at how few we have on tape. However, it is likely they were seeing a dead body of one. We only have about 50 specimens of giant found, so it's entirely possible that they come much larger. Alright, as a historian... Giants. They exist in some form over many cultures in history. My favorite story is about a Native American tribe that told the story of the giants that killed them to near extinction generations upon generations ago, and how they were a horrible beast and quite large, all the characteristics of giants. Truth be told, and this is probably true of most legends and accounts of giants, that it's just a height relative thing. A majority of a population was quite small back in the day. Besides being easier to hide and run, less body mass meant less food needed, and more chances of survival. But I digress. People were quite small, like average five-footers and less. Anyone who was taller was probably considered a giant, and a whole tribe of giant people, five foot ten and above, must have been especially terrifying when they were a warring tribe or just in conflict with you. So the generational story was just about a smaller height-wise tribe that encountered a taller height-wise tribe and they fought the story of the giants. The natives have a lot of stories of supernatural creatures that were just odd to them humans. The pale-faced beasts were probably Vikings. Vikings caused a whole migration of a tribe as well. It's really interesting in my field of work to just put things in perspective. You gain so much. I believe that Bigfoot probably does exist, or at least did until very recently. But I doubt it was a unique species, 
My theory is that what people see is a mundane animal, probably a large brown bear with serious genetic deformities. Encountering a seven foot bear with mange, maybe a deformed cranium, possible scars from fights with other bears, and other such traits would certainly trigger a fight or flight response. You see something like that, you haul in the other direction. When you stop, you're not 100% sure of what you saw, so your brain fills in the details. So you take a deformed animal and mix it with an imaginative mind that knows what the popular version of Bigfoot looks like, and you get a bona fide Bigfoot sighting. You know, when a bear has been shot and skinned, it looks disturbingly humanoid. I won't say that you just debunked Bigfoot, but I'm sure that someone somewhere has seen a particularly pitiful bear and thought it was an ape sort of thing. After all, an animal with no hair looks a lot like an animal with no skin. And that's the end of Ask Reddit. As far as legends and history go, what legendary creature do you believe may have been real and probably existed in some way? Or what supposedly legendary person in history was more than likely real? Do you have any favorites that you would like to add to the list? Be sure to leave them in the comments down below. While you're down there, be sure to hit the like button. Get subscribed and share this video with your friends so that you all can discuss the fantastical creatures and people discussed in this video. Thank you for watching this most amazing facts video and we will see you in the next one.